Well, we will jump right into things. And today we're going to be taking a look at 1 John chapter 4. 1 John chapter 4. We're going to be taking a look at verses 7 through 11 this morning. 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Today what we're going to be doing is we're going to be talking about how we can love. Now, last week we started off by talking about um, some things about love. And we looked at how um, we need love in order to serve God. When we have love, we have something that's vibrant. We have something that's real and genuine. Without love, we are nothing more than just simply a religious organization going through the motions. And so we've got to have love. Um, but um, it's easy to say it, but how are we going to do it, right? You know, if we're going to say, all right, we need love, um, how are we going to go about doing it? Because it's not going to do any good if we don't know how to love. And I know that you might think, oh, let love, that's easy. But I want you to just really stop and think about this. In fact, I want to ask you a question. And we're going to go through this. We're going to talk more about this at the end of the message. But I want you to just think about this for a second, okay? Is love impossible, difficult, or doable? Okay? Is love impossible? difficult, and doable. Everybody might say, oh, love, yeah, no problem, easy. But is it really? You look at the world today. You look at our society, what it's going through. Um, you don't see a lot of love, do you? And I'm not saying it on one side of the political aisle or the other. I'm not saying it as far as, you know, one, you know, this. I, it's just that when you look at life, when you look at society, you don't see a whole lot of love. And it's not just simply here in America either. You go around the world, around the globe, you see time and time again of examples of where people aren't loving. And when you look at all the things that are going on, some of it would be really easily fixed if we just say, hey, let's just, let's just love each other, right? But the problem is we've been saying that for years and years and years. And these things aren't getting worked out. And as a matter of fact, when you go and you even expand it, and you look at it not just simply to our country, not just simply globally, but you look at it all throughout history, we've had a problem with this. And so when you think, oh, love, okay, yeah, that's easy. Well, wait a minute. Is it really? Is it impossible? Is it difficult? Or is it even doable? Okay? Now, let's take a look at those later on. We're going to see those answers. And what we're going to see in this morning's message is that the answer to those questions really comes out with this. Love is possible. Love comes from having a relationship with God. And only when we have that relationship with God can we love like God wants us to love. Okay? All right, let's take a look at 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. Now, this is 1 John chapter 4, not John chapter 4. Okay? Some people, they... they they, they, they don't hear me say the, the first, and so they're, they're reading in John chapter 4, and I'm reading in 1 John chapter 4, and they're thinking, this is two totally different things. What is he doing? Okay, so 1 John chapter 4, beginning verse 7, it says this, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us, okay? Now, kind of going back to a little bit about what we talked about um, last week, is we talked a little bit about love, okay? And love really is an action. I know that when we think about love, our first thought, what we first go to, is an emotion. And at the same time, I want you to understand that love is an emotion, you know? But as far as what we see in the Greek language, what we see in the Bible is that the, the emphasis of love is not on the emotional side. The emphasis of love of what we're talking about is really on the action side. You know, you can, you can feel one way, 
but not do anything about it, and it really doesn't amount to anything. It really is love. But at the same time, when we talk about Christian love, when we talk about God's love for us and what we need to do with it, we need to understand that there is an action involved. Now, it originates from an emotion, and so that's what's going to prompt everything. But what the emphasis is on is on an action. And the action in which we're talking about is something that's going to be seeking other people's benefit. Okay? So when we look at love and we compare to what the Bible says about love, to what society says about love, we may come up with two different concepts. What society says about love is just simply, oh, well, you go do your own thing, you go live your own way, and I'm not going to criticize you, I'm not going to say anything bad about it. I'm just going to, you know, it, everybody has their own little thing, and that's what a lot of the society says about love. But when you look at the Bible, you look at what the Bible says about love, what love is going to be is I'm going to seek someone else's benefit. I'm going to do something above my own interests. That's what love is all about. Now, if I'm going to be seeking somebody else's benefit, it could be at the expense of my own interest. Maybe not necessarily. I mean, we can love other people. We can love our Christian brothers and sisters. We can love God. And we might not ever have to sacrifice anything of ourselves. But if we really want to be honest about it, there's going to be times that loving people means that we might have to sacrifice something. It may mean that we might have to sacrifice time. It may mean that we might have to sacrifice energy. Or we might have to sacrifice the hardest thing of all to sacrifice, our pride. You know, that a lot of it is a lot of the case right there. We don't like to sacrifice our pride. But if we're going to be seeking someone else's interest and someone else's benefit, there are some times that we've got to sacrifice our pride in order for us to go and do what God wants for us to do. Now, I also talked about last week about how um, Christian love is not just one-dimensional. We just think of Christian love oftentimes as far as between us and someone else. But we need to understand that Christian love is two-dimensional, and that is that we have God, and we have God first loving us, and because God first loves us, then therefore that gives us the opportunity to respond in loving to God. And because of that response that we have and that relationship that we have, then we have the ability to go out and start to love other people. And that's really what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the message today. Okay? Now, one thing that we need to understand is this. And that is that love is really a part of God's character. Okay? So if you take a look at verse number 7, you see a little bit of instructions about why we should love. First part of verse 7 says this. Dear friends, let us love one another. And so there it is right there. There's the instruction, right? Let us love one another. That's what we need to be doing as, as Christian brothers and sisters. We need to be loving each other. So why should we love each other? Well, this reason right here. For love comes from God. Okay? So the origin of love is from God. And what I said before is that it is really uh, two-dimensional. We have love that is coming from God. And because we have love that is coming from God, therefore, what are we going to do with it? We are therefore going to go and love each other. And the reason why love is going to come from God is because of who he really is. I want you to take a look. It's there in uh, verse number 8, but I want you to go down to verse number 16. There's just a little bitty phrase there in verse number 16 to take a look at. But in verse number 16, you notice it says this, God is love. Okay? God is love. Now, I want you to really stop and think about this for a second. God is not just simply someone who loves. He is not simply someone who goes and does something that is characterized by love. It's that God is love. Okay? So love isn't just simply something that God does. Love isn't simply something that God shows. God is love. Love. Love is tied up in God's character, in his characteristics. You know, we think about God, and we think about God being holy. We think about God being just. 
We think about God being all-knowing. We think about him being all-powerful. We think about him being everywhere at the same time. We think about him being eternal, right? But one of those characteristics that God has is that God is love. Now, we can't turn it around and look at it backwards. We can't say that love is God because that's not it. It's just that love is a description of what God's uh, character is. And so when you think about where love is, comes from because of God and because of who he is that's where love comes from so when we look at verse number seven it says that love comes from God we can see why love comes from God is because that is part of his characteristics and God cannot divorce himself from love any more than he can divorce himself from being holy, any more than he can divorce himself from being eternal, so on and so forth, because that is bound up into who he is. And if God were to simply take love and kind of loose it away from himself, then he wouldn't be God anymore, because that is his characteristic. And when we think about what love is, and we think about how we can have love, and how we can have the ability to love, and how we can have, you know, the concept of love in the universe, it's because it comes from God. It is where he is. And so when you think about this world today, and you think about all the problems, you think about all the hatred, you think about all the violence, you think about all the things that go against love, that's one way right there that you can think that this world is very much away and apart from really, really God. Okay, And so if we're going to say that we're going to follow God, then don't you see how we've got to have love that's in there? And like I preached last week, is that if we don't have love in serving God, then it's nothing more than just simply going through a religious exercise because of what we're talking about right here, that God is love. And so again, we're going to say, well, all right, we need to have love. How are we going to have it? Well, one thing is this, and that is love is really expressed, God's love to us is really expressed through Jesus. Now, let's skip over verse the rest, verse number 7, verse number 8. We're going to come back to it. But I want you to take a look at verses 9 and verse number 10. In verse number 9, it says this. In verse number 9, it says, This is how God showed his love among us. He sent His one and only Son into the world that we might live through Him. This is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. So when we look at these verses, we see how God expresses His love to us, how God shows His love to us. God shows His love to us is what it says there in verse number 9 is that he sent his one and only son into the world. Okay, So if you stop and think about that, God sending his one and only son into the world is an act of love in and of itself. Now I go back and talk about that definition of love and how love is not, um, it's based in emotion, but it's really talking about an action. You can see it right there. And that is based on God's emotional love for the world. He is going to therefore go and put that into effect, into action, by sending his son into the world. And you say, okay, sending his son into the world, how is that, how is that an act of love? Well, let's just put it this way. Um, we live in a pretty, pretty good city. You know, we, have, we live in a pretty good place and country, you know. Um, you take someone who's near to you, somebody who's dear to you. How would you like to send that person to the worst, most awfulest, dangerous, terrible place on the planet? Would you want to do it? I mean, normally when we think about, you know, parents and children or anything like that, we want to put them into a good place, right? We want to, to, to get them into a safe place. We want to get them into, we want to get them into good schools. We want to get them in a good neighborhood. We want to get them around good uh, friends and everything like that. But say, oh, I'm going to take my kid and I'm going to send them into the worst possible place on the earth. You got to, why? Why? So if you think about it in that regard, we have the father who is sending the son from 
heaven down to this earth and not down to this earth to where we live today, but living in a place that um, didn't have the comforts that we had to a family that didn't have the means that um, we would have, okay? So if you think about, okay, I'm going to send my son, my one and only son, to that place, that in and of itself is an act of love, right? It is an action. And it's something that is going to be seeking the benefit of other people. Because you notice what it says here, as we look back in verse number 9 again, that he sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Okay? And so the reason why God sent the son into this world is so that we can live with him. When we look at Jesus, and we look at what Jesus did, how he came and he lived his life full of grace, full of truth, to show us the way to the Father. As a matter of fact, he told Philip, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes unto the Father except through me. And so Jesus coming and Jesus laying down his, his perfect life as a sacrifice for each and every person's sins, that seeks our benefit, doesn't it? When you think about what God did and what God gave up for us, it's enormous. I mean, it's tremendous. It's, 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 um, um, what would be the right word? It's crazy good, okay? I mean, when you think about what God has done, you know, just simply sending his son to this earth is one thing, but for his son to go and live the kind of life that he lived and die the kind of death that he died so that he can give each and every one of us, eternal life. He can be, is what it says there in the end of verse number 9, he can be our eternal sacrifice. He can be our atoning sacrifice and take away our sins. And so when you think about it, this really is the greatest love of all. Now, we come back to our original question, and that is just simply this. How can we love? Well, we can love when we start to have God's nature of loving, Okay? And that is that when we look at verse number 7 and verse number 8 again, we see that love comes from God. But everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, when we look at that, we say, well, wait a minute. Does that mean in order to be a Christian, in order to be born again, I've got to love, and by loving, I become a Christian, and I become born again. And at the same time, if we go down that route, then there's probably going to be times that we don't love, right? And so when we catch ourselves not loving, we think, Whoa, wait a minute, does this mean that I'm not a Christian? Does this mean that even though I thought I was born again, maybe I'm not or maybe it means that, you know, I've, I've lost it in some way. I want us to look at verse number 7. I want us to look at verse number 8 as far as a result of being born again, but not a means of being born again. Okay? If we take a look at verse number, uh, chapter 5 and verse number 1, it says this, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Okay? So, believing that Jesus is the Messiah, believing that God sent Jesus to be that sacrifice, and by placing our faith in what Jesus did, that's how we're born again. And once we're born again, then we go on to love. Now, taking a look at being born again, you remember that Jesus talked about being born again um, with a man named Dick Nicodemus in John chapter 3. John chapter 3, there is a ruler of the Jews named Nicodemus that came to Jesus by night because he had some questions that he probably didn't want other people um, knowing that he was asking about. After all, he was a ruler of the Jews. He was supposed to have the answers, not questions. But the questions that he had were, um, um, how can, um, we know that you come from God because nobody can do these miraculous signs that you were doing. And Jesus just simply cuts to the chase in verse number 3 and says, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. 
Now, they had this conversation, a discussion about being born again and what it means, to which Jesus finally said, you know, you are Israel's teacher in verse number 10, and, and you don't understand these things? Jesus said being born of the, again, being born of the Spirit is like the, the wind blowing. You know, you can, you, it's, it's the wind blowing through the trees. You can see the effects of it, but you don't know where it comes from. You don't know where it's going. And he's confused about all of this. But I want you to see in verse number 11, he says this, John chapter 3 and verse number 11. I tell you the truth. We speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things, and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the Son of Man. Now, isn't that kind of what we were just talking about as far as God love and God's love being shown and expressed from the fact that he sent his one and only son to this earth. Now, continuing on down, he says this in verse number 14, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the son of man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Now, what Jesus was talking about was the story back in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the Israelites grumbled and complained against God, and God was very upset with them. And so he caused these poisonous snakes to bite them, and the bite was fatal. And so because of that, they cried out to Moses. Moses talked to God, and God said, this is what you need to do. You need to take um, of some brass, and you need to make it look like the snake, and you need to put it on a pole. And if anybody would just simply look at that snake, They'll be cured. They'll, they'll be well. Now, God did this to demonstrate the fact that this is what the son was going to do. As the snake on the pole was necessary for physical life and physical deliverance, Jesus Christ being lifted up on Calvary's cross is going to be necessary for spiritual life and spiritual deliverance. And so... If you live back then and you were an Old Testament Israelite, you got bit by a snake, what are you going to do? You're going to say, oh, no, I got bit by a snake. That's the first thing you're going to say, right? <laughs> Second thing you're going to say is, um, you know, what am I going to do? And somebody's going to tell you, oh, well, um, you know, I've, I've heard that if you go and you, you make this, um, you know, remedy and put it on there, you're going to be all better. Don't you love the, the old wives' tales? I mean, you know, it seems like... Uh, you go someplace and people will tell you these old wives' tales about being cured about some things. I remember my dad, one time when he was in college, he had this really, really bad cold, couldn't shake it, couldn't shake it, went home. Of course, he and my mom were just recently married, and um, they went back to, to my, my grandparents' house, my mom's mom and dad's. And uh, my grandma said, hey, I've got this concoction that will, uh, you know, cure you up. And uh, some of the ingredients in it were uh, turpentine and uh, things like that. My, my dad got to the ingredient of black powder. When he found out that there was black powder in the concoction, he said, never mind. <laughs> I'm not going to take it. I don't know what in the world that concoction was, but, uh, you know, somebody could probably come up with a concoction like that. You know, you got bit by a snake. Um, then, you know, here, here's this concoction that's got turpentine and pine tar and black powder and, uh, you know, castor oil and the whole bit. Um, so, uh, no, I'm not going to do that. Well, here's another solution. The solution is that you trust God and you do what God wants. Oh, okay. Well, what is that? Well, the reason why you got bit to begin with is because of sin and the representation of that sin or what is going to take away that sin is on a pole. And what God wants you to do is believe and trust that if you look to what is going to take your sin away and if you'll just simply look at it, then you'll be cured. Now that's the same way as Jesus. And that is here, Jesus is, he's come, sent from the Father, all right, And he is one that is going to take away the sins of the world. He is our turn, uh, atoning sacrifice. But that doesn't mean that everybody's sin is going to be taken away. Because people need to stop and realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm in a bad predicament. 
I'm in a place that I need to be forgiven in order to have spiritual life, in order to have eternity with God. And by looking at what God has done, by looking at the, the, the remedy that God has sent for sin, Jesus Christ, not physically because we can't physically see it, by, but by looking at it in terms of saying this is what's going to be my salvation, we can have eternal life. Now we go on to what may be the most famous verse in the Bible, John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him will not perish but have eternal life. But continuing to read into verse number 17 to verse number 18, I think is even as important. Verse number 17 is this, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through Him. Whoever believes is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And so here's God's remedy. Jesus Christ on the cross. And it's there because of God's love for us. Right? And because that remedy is there, if people will just realize, hey, I'm in the predicament of being lost, God has provided my salvation on the cross. And if I will just simply turn to God because of what Jesus has done and ask him for forgiveness, ask him for eternal life, then I can be saved. If I believe in Jesus, if I believe that I'll have eternal life because of what God has done through Jesus Christ, then I'll be saved. And when somebody is saved, they are born again. The old things are gone, new things have come. It is, a, a, you know, when, when you think about being born again, you're, you're, you're thinking about a, a beginning, having a new start, having a fresh start, having something that is right there. You know, when a child is born, they, they, a, a life starts right there, you know. That's, a, that's our birthday. Most people have one birthday. Some people have two, you know, but, but most people have just that one bird, and then it's the start of their life, right? You know? Of course, you can talk to Louise about that later. <laughs> so, but, but uh, you know, when we are born again, it's the same thing. We start then with our spiritual lives, and then we are that way for eternity. So being born again is not because we love, but we love because we're born again. Now, if you stop and think about this, if we're born again, going back to John chapter, 1 John chapter 4, if we are um, born again and born of God, then since God is love, then because we are his children, we have those traits of love. That's his characteristic, and because we're his children, we have that within ourselves, okay? And so, going back to verse number 7 again, it says that everyone who loves has been born of God. That's not the, um, the cause of being born again. That is the, 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 the result of being born again. That is that when we are born again, we therefore love, and so... Whoever is loving is showing that they have the evidence of being born again. And someone who does not love, they don't have Christian love. Now, they can have love as far as the world understands it, and as far as the emotion is and everything like that, but as far as the, 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 the dimension between God loving us and we reciprocating back, and then from that relationship, us loving other people, you know, people who don't have that relationship with God, they don't have that ability there to love. Now, they can love as far as what the world understands, but we're talking about very specifically from what God has. So when we look at it this way, how can we love? Well, going back to this question again, and that is, is love impossible, difficult, or doable. Okay? 
It's, it's actually kind of all of it, right? Is love impossible? Yeah, it is. When you look at it in terms of what God wants, what God expects, as far as God being love, as far as love coming from God, love is impossible unless we have a relationship with God. And once we have a relationship with God, then it is possible. But we've got to have that relationship first. Now, like I said, you know, we can have love for family and friends, and we can have love as far as I'm going to do this, and we can even have something as far as I'm even going to sacrifice something for myself for somebody else. But to love because we have a love for God, it takes that relationship from God. There are some people who think, oh, okay, well, I'm going to love, and I'm going to, I'm going to help my neighbor out, and I'm going to help my family out, and I'm going to help my coworkers out, and um, even though my coworker just did something to me that I don't really like and it really irritates me and I, I really deep down hate their guts, I'm going to do something because that's the right thing to do, okay? And I'm going to do this because, after all, I want to be a Christian and I want to go to heaven. Okay, well, what's missing there is that there is not the relationship. And that's what makes the true Christian love impossible, okay? But once we have that relationship... It is something that it is possible, but at the same time, is it difficult? Yeah, it's difficult. Jesus said, love your enemies. How hard is that? Well, if it wasn't hard, I don't think Jesus would have said it. Jesus said, you know, even the heathens, like the people who like them, you know, that's the easy thing. You know, if you want to have love for somebody who loves you, ah, that's, that's a piece of cake. You know, you can do that. That's, that's like, you know, just second nature. But to go and, and have love for somebody who has done something against you or who is against you, now that's hard, isn't it? As a matter of fact, going back to the other thing about impossible, it really is impossible unless, of course, we have the love of God operating within our life. Where we start to understand that God has loved us and we love God, and because God has loved us and we love God, therefore we, because of our love for God, are therefore going to act loving towards other people. You know, that's how we can do it. If we just simply go, oh, okay, you know, I'm just going to love everybody. I, I'm, oh, oh, you know, that person has just said that about me to somebody else and to somebody else, and it's worked back through the grapevine. And, uh, you know, I, I've, I've had that happen to me. It, it's like, you know, at work, somebody goes and, and says something about me to somebody else and somebody else, somebody else, and it comes to Shannon. Shannon texts me and says, don't be mad, but... <laughs> And I think, of course I'm mad because the person that she told to begin with, it was their fault that they had the problem and it's not mine, but I'm getting the blame for it, okay? And then you have to go back and you have to help them again. And so you have to just, okay, God, help me to love. Help me to love. Help me to love those people who are not showing love to me. Help me to love those people who are my enemies, I mean, look at a bigger picture and realize that we don't battle against flesh and blood, but we battle against principalities and rulers and dark forces. But is love doable? Yes, it really is. It's doable when we have God's Spirit operating and working within us. As a matter of fact, the first fruit of the Spirit that's listed in Galatians chapter 5, and verse number 22 is what? It's love. Fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, so on and so forth. It's been a while since church camp. I can't remember all of them, right? So, love, joy, peace. So we've got love, and love is something that the Holy Spirit works in our life. But we've got to have and maintain a good relationship with God in order for that to happen. So my final question to you this morning is just simply this, or just simply this, let's be sure to love, and let's be sure to allow our saved new nature to come through. 
This morning, if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, then allow the, the Holy Spirit to bring out that sight in you. Whether you realize it or not, if you are a child of God, then you have those traits and those characteristics of love. Now, there may be some other things there that are kind of burying it, and there may be some things that are covering it over, but you as a child of God, deep down, you have the ability to love because you have been born again from a Father who is love, and love does come from God. Okay? Now, again, it may be covered up, and so we may need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our lives. We may be and, you know, ask God to please, uh, you know, use me, help me to have this kind of love. And surprisingly enough, when we do that, there are some times that we're going to love and later on we're going to think about it and we go, how did that happen? I, I didn't even realize it. Well, it's because of God. It's going to be times that we do things and somebody comes up and goes, man, you are just such a kind, loving person. And we're like, I didn't realize that. Well, it's because of God. But if God is within us, we've got to allow that. And so if you're saved this morning, then do that. And today, if you've been listening to this message and you've been thinking, you know what, I, I, I don't know that I have that. I don't know that I've ever come to a point in my life where I realize that Jesus is my Savior and that I've, I've trusted him to save me. And that I've gone to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. I, I don't know that I've ever been born again. Well, you've got to be born again in order to have those traits. And like I said, God, because of his love for us, has given us the greatest gift anyone could, could have ever had, and that is eternal life. It's there. It's free. It's, it's, it is for the asking. Say, what do I have to do to, to, to have? Do I need to go to church all the time? No. Do I, do I have to be a religious person? No. Do I have to give money? No. No. What you do have to do is you have to sacrifice your pride, though. You have to realize, hey, I'm a sinner, and that God sent Jesus for my salvation. And then because of that, I, I turn to the Lord, and I ask him, to save me and to forgive me. So today, whether you're watching us on Facebook or you're here, if you don't have that relationship, I hope that you'll just come to the point in your life where you realize it, you'll trust God to be your Savior because of what Jesus has done, and that you'll just simply bow your head and ask him to save you. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you for everything that you've given us. We thank you for your blessings, and we thank you for allowing us to be here together this morning looking at your word. We ask that you would please be with us, lead us, and guide us to where we need to go. And Lord, please uh, um, be at this message. Allow it to reach people's hearts and minds wherever they need to be reached. Lord, please forgive us of our sins. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.